Hey everybody, this is Greg Dawson, G D Napsy. I'm not an attorney, you don't have much to practice law, don't practice law, don't give legal advice. If you feel you need legal advice, consult with an attorney and be legally advised. Now, this is part two of my Greg Beats a Traffic Ticket, and it's uh, related to the case out of Hillsborough County, which was 14 CT 66525. Um, and what you're going to hear in this is an interchange between myself, uh, Judge Conrad, who does an outstanding job guiding me through the process, and you're even going to hear me use language and make reference to a bunch of statutes and a bunch of codes, which I, I do know them, but the context of their usage may have been a little off at this, at this time, particularly in my journey, at this time of my journey. But what I can say is I'm appreciative to the ancestors, uh, the most high, uh, and everybody and everything else that made it possible for me to get through this process without becoming uh, a total jackass along the way and losing the case. But the context and the substantive issues of the case, uh, of, the, of the case itself, I did manage to stay on uh, track with. So as we go through this, and again, everybody's case may be different, but what I'm here to show you is that as a self-represented litigant a pro se there are ways that you can win cases on your own i don't necessarily suggest it but if you ever find yourself in a situation you may need our help again go to the website go to greggoss.com uh, and um, or you can contact me directly and we can see what we can do based upon the facts of your case so let's get to this case uh, which is my june 10th it would be a motions hearing and we'll pick it up from right here Now, this challenge to the statute, probably at the time that I may have thought that it mattered, is probably going to need to learn through the internet, through some other source. But if you read the constitutional challenges to the statute, you'll find out particularly related to, to state law that the court can just summarily get rid of your challenge to the statute, and this request for intervention probably is going to take you nowhere. I would say, as you're going to find out, as Judge Conrad directs us as we go through this process, stick to the issues of your case, the rules that re are related to your case, come to a good legal analysis, and then come use a, a conclusion that will get you the remedy that you seek. You all should have that as well. Uh, okay. So I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if that's that set for today. Well, well the motion is here it is, but the notice to, to challenge the, the, staff, the statute, I don't think would have been necessary because they haven't provided discovery, so I'm asking for a motion to dismiss on grounds of their failure to provide okay, discovery. Okay, well, let's do this. Let's start with, because all I have is a demand for dismissal of action, and um, I'll let you uh, entertain if you want uh, those. I don't know if there's a separate, it looks like you may have a separate demand for dismissal uh, based on various grounds that are look like maybe 1 through 11, and I don't know whether that corresponds with your motion or not. So you go ahead and tell me... Uh, one at a time what the reasons are that you think the case should be dismissed, okay? Okay, well, I want the record to reflect on here, still in the special appearance, okay. on the record, I know you didn't mention it, and I'm here in appropriate facade. One, the first issue is that, pursuant to Article 3 of the United States Constitution, there has to be a certified delegation of authority order on the record signed and authorized by Congress to certify this as a legitimate court, as well as Title 28, Section 3002 of the United States Code. I've asked for I'm going to say this as we move along into this case. He's going to come back and we're going to cover where federal law applies and where state law applies. And again, this is early on in my, my journey. And 
he's going to clean up a whole lot of the confusion along the way. I'm not going to interrupt it too many more times, but I just thought it would be better for me to give you a narrative as we go along with this proceeding. And it may not be the same that you hear from an attorney or from some other people who may have gotten their remedy through other means, but whenever there's an issue of a state court or state crime or state law, before even a federal court would even matter, you have to exhaust all of your state remedies uh, before you can think about moving into federal law. And really, it doesn't really, it doesn't apply uh, in, in most of the instances, uh, particularly as a, a traffic case is uh, concerned. So uh, keep that in mind as we move along with uh, this uh, June 10th, 2015 hearing. Specific things, one of which is that because if you can't certify that you're authorized to bring the action, you can't bring the action. Under those grounds alone, the action should be dismissed. At that point, uh, does, first, that, does that section apply uh, only to federal courts? You know, well, no, it applies to this court as well because if you're going to say your court, the courts have been defined by Title 28, Section 2002, which is easily obtainable. I like this. Well, this is the United States Code, that's why I'm asking the right. question. If it's talking about a court of inferior jurisdiction and the delegation of authority signed by Congress, uh, that would seem generally to apply to federal courts, and that's why I'm asking, do you have? something that says it applies to all courts. Any court, because the issue becomes at that point jurisdiction. So if you're claiming to be a court of inferior or any court of jurisdiction, then that jurisdiction has to be proven. And I've asked for them to prove jurisdiction. One, I've also asked to tell me what's the nature of causation, which is what the discovery is about. And I'm sure the Brady the case would cover that. They can't just say, I'm not going to give you discovery. But I'm accusing you of something which you can't prove. Let's go. Now, Brady is applicable even at the state level and that's some of the, the basic requirements that a, uh, a prosecutor or the state whoever is accusing you of an offense would have to turn over information they were going to use or they may use in a case against you. They don't have to give you all of the uh, their strategies but they are fundamental uh, requirements that they would have to give you in any criminal, uh, for any criminal allegation. We get a little bit further into that, but I just wanted to, to I wanted to point that out. That's number two. Okay. Those rules of criminal procedure you demanded. Did you get notice of discovery? I did. Did you um, respond? I, yeah, I'm waiting to be signed at my office right now. Yes. It's just because it's prepared, waiting what? to be signed. Okay, when did you get the notice? Um, I don't have a file with me, Your Honor, so I can't say that with any certainty right now. Okay. okay. Yes, yes, sir, go ahead. The second of May. I'm probably walking away from the podium and going back to the, the general gallery to get the information. And going back and forth between the gallery and him, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but it's going to turn it off. Yeah. Copy of the writ of discovery. Uh, can I go through the right now? Do you have a copy of that that's been filed? I'm this. I mean, there's a stamp that says it may have been received by the state attorney's office on May 2nd. And that stamp would also correspond with the date that I filed the challenge to the statute. But you don't have that that's been, the writ of discovery has not been filed in the court file or it has been? Yeah, you have a copy of it, right? I'm sorry? That is our stamp. Okay. So I do have a copy when I realized that discovery had not been done. Okay. that issue. So you, you filed a demand for discovery, a writ for discovery. Looks like it may have been received. Actually, it has not been filed. Um, at least what the clerk is saying, um, that it's not filed. You may have given a copy of that to the state or hand delivered a copy of it to the state. But it's, they don't have a record that's been filed in the court file. But the state was on notice to provide that. She said that's, that's done. Um, based on that request, what's the legal authority for you to get the case dismissed? 
the judge to rule, it actually rules on matter when the Constitution is the issue, because the Constitution will pull the rule down. But in the course of rule 3.220, it's pretty clear that you have 15 days in order to provide adequate discovery. They've been noticed, and, and if they file the office, they file the case, and they're saying that there's a crime committed, I have the right to ask you what is the crime, and you don't have the courage to not tell me what the crime is. Yeah, she's saying she's going to sign it and get you the information I, I today, so my question is, given that information, what legal basis do you have to get the case dismissed? It's beyond 15 days. And she's, her, her, to, to summarily take her, her word over mine, she says she has it. So she had time to file. If you had time to say that I committed some allegation, which we don't know who's saying I committed any allegation, you can't say, well, I'm going to respond to something this far, this far down the road. That's actually unfair. Well, I agree with you. That's part of the Constitution. I agree with you that you're entitled to the information. And I don't think the state... But the question becomes, just bear with me, is that even if they don't comply within 15 days that the rule suggests, you're arguing that the case should be dismissed, and that's where I really need to find out why, in that period of time, why the case has to be dismissed. No, he's absolutely correct. What he's asking me for is, and you can take your notes on this, I made a request, and although he may have discretion to impose sanctions, and he'll go over this later on in the end, what I learned along the way is to find some binding authority that would have mandated that because they failed to follow the rules, which the rules of court do matter, people, that they didn't follow the rules, that simply them not, them simply not following the rules is not necessarily a fundamental violation of the Constitution necessarily, and different facts can probably bring about a different determination by the court. But he's going to tell you, but before he issues sanctions, he can compel them. There's a whole bunch of other things that can go on. But I just wanted to make sure I pointed out that the rules of court and rules do matter, as well as statutes matter, unless there is a clear violation of a fundamental constitutional right. But those things are, you know, within the exceptions and the rules, and the exceptions to certain rules. But for every rule, there's an exception, and for one exception, there could be several other exceptions. And these are other things that I've learned over the course of these five or six years. And a lot of it I've gotten through consultations with attorneys along the way. And order them and compel them to give you that information if they didn't timely comply. And if they don't deal with that order to compel, I can sanction them. And whether that includes dismissal or not, I don't know if that would be appropriate. Okay. It would not be appropriate in as much as they have taken ethics oaths as well. One, in accordance with Chapter 4, Section 3.8 of the Florida Rules of Conduct, Professional Conduct, which is not a constitutional issue at this point, but it's an issue relative to Article 2, because they're actually people who have judiciary responsibility in Article 2, Section 5, is clear with this. Now you're wasting the taxpayer's money. Because if there was, in fact, a crime, it should be easy to prove, and you should bring forth the information the first day I was here. And I asked for the information. Right now, and on the grounds alone, you can't give them the right to say, well, we're not going to do something at this amount of time, when the rule is stated, and then extend it, because then it's a 14th Amendment issue. Because now you're saying we're going to create a special rule that's going to violate what the Constitution tells you. Again, you're arguing what, I guess, what you think should happen, and I need legal basis. You want case law? Well, you would have to show to me. I'm not aware of any case law that says, and I've been doing it a little bit longer than some people, that says if they don't timely comply under the rule of criminal procedure with 3.220, that your remedy is dismissal. The courts actually take a different approach, unless the nature of the violation is intentional or egregious, or somehow fundamentally violates your right to a fair trial, that there would not be, that would be too extreme a sanction. Okay, I'll probably agree with that. But if you go to, I believe it's an ACES decision, because if the issue becomes a jurisdiction, once I challenge a jurisdiction, you can't move anywhere until jurisdiction is proven. We're going to do this in another time and another place, and you can search this a whole bunch of ways. This issue of jurisdiction that used to get banned about quite a bit is simple in most regards. If you've been served, if you've been, if the action took place in a particular demographic, I mean a geographical location, the court's going to probably have jurisdiction. 
in this instance, does the court have the authority to hear the case and give them jurisdiction? But do they have jurisdiction over the case based upon all the other factors? That could be something. But in this instance, I'll say this, that a lot of my uh, bloviating in this case, in this at this time, was because of my, my ignorance. Now, I, I obviously had some basic reading or studying understanding. Uh, I mean, certain principles I understood because of my studying. You say that. And through that, I can recite quite a bit. And my other background helped me as well, from education to being a tutor to being a union steward, those things, being in the military, of course, shouts and army uh, a little bit. But that aided me in my understanding of the literature part of it, or the black letter of law, statutes, and things that I've, I've read. The application part is what I gained through the several experiences, and even though I didn't really want them, but I did uh, gain a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge because not only did I go to, into the courts to do the, this, which you're hearing now and many others, I also sat in on other court hearings and other court proceedings uh, that were unassociated with me or unrelated to me or anybody I knew so that I could kind of watch how the courts operated, how attorneys postured themselves. So I spent a lot of hours uh, doing uh, observations of different cases and it helped me along the way. And again, certain consultations with attorneys, uh, how I feel about a lot of them personally it doesn't really matter. Uh, but it was, they, many times you can get some pretty good information, even if it's information to tell you what not to do. And uh, as far as the 3.220 violation of the not having 15 days, there could be an argument for appellate purposes for a delay in justice, but that's a little bit something we'll get to down the line in some further, some uh, future videos. But let's pick it back up, and I don't want to drag this 35 minute session out to two or three hours. Plainly, there's a crime that's been committed, and then we have the issue of corpus delecta, and then we also have the ulterior health care component. Well, let's start, let's start with the, because you don't have to rule on these one at a time. So, in, in terms of the first argument, Article 3, uh, under an uh, with 28 U.S.C. 3002, you're suggesting that as an element of going forward, they have to prove upon demand uh, that they were have a certified delegation of authority signed by Congress. Is that your position? Yeah, that's my position as well. Okay. There's an Article 5 issue before the court. Do you want to respond to that? Or? Okay. And, and, and again, uh, and, and then the next argument is that they didn't timely discover, provide discovery within 15 days under Rule 3.220, and that you believe that because of that, the action should be dismissed. That's the second round. Correct? Yes, sir. All right. Now, let's go. Now, go, just continue with your arguments. Okay. And, and the Sixth Amendment issue is the Brady issue as well, as well as um, Article 1, Section 16 before the Constitution, because it's clear, and it's not ambiguous, that if you're going to claim somebody's committed an act of crime, they have the right to be informed of the nature and the cause of such accusation, which is going back to the ethics issue 3.8. You shouldn't even file the action on it. It wasn't substantiated by probable cause. Well, can I ask you a question? Did you get a copy of the citation or anything yet? Uh, the citation? Yeah, that would be the charging document, I believe. I believe. Oh, I think they gave me some documents. I did with I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I just okay, no, no. I, I, have, a, you want to know I have no problem. Is. I can address that issue as well. Yeah. Because there is no action, as far as I'm concerned, meaning that's substantial constitutionally as well, substantive constitutionally, I put no contract on it and sent it back to the lawyer for them within three, within 72 hours. Did I have, you put that on the, the charging you have, the, the citation you brought Yes, on? sir. Yes, sir. I didn't bring, I, didn't, I don't think that I put that in my, uh, according to this, it looks like, and again, I, I didn't probably, I didn't set the court date. No, it looks like under... Duress. I'm the threat of duress and coercion because I didn't sign anything without them un unlawfully just uh, seizing me and putting me as a, is this a you kidnapping, me, essentially. Is that a copy of the citation? Okay. Let, let me say this real quick. I know I keep saying I'm not going to interrupt, but I, I just think it's very important that along the way we clear up some things that I did not know at the time here. I mean, at the time that I was doing this uh, hearing that I learned along the way that no contract. The threat, duress, and coercion issue, that could be a federal rights issue, and depending on your state, how your state's constitution is read, because 
Don't forget that states have the right to enforce police powers as they, as they wish. But this may have been an issue for what we would call later on, or what I later on came to know as a suppression hearing uh, to get the stop, you know, thrown out or to say there's no probable cause for the issuance of the citation uh, that led to the uh, prosecutor charging. It had been easy, it was, as I learned later on, like I said again, it was easier to address the stop itself than it was to address some of this other stuff. It could have just, like I might have just drugged this thing out a lot farther than it needed to be. say this. I, I said something about it earlier about how the ancestors, uh, Most High, and a whole lot of other things were great intervening factors, but one was to have Judge Conrad as the first judge, because uh, later on down the line, I definitely dealt with some judges who were definitely not as, who I would not consider to be as honorable as he, he has been in this, particularly his professorial way of allowing me to go through uh, some would say he's doing his job, but the way that he handled the court, he didn't jump on me. He obviously had to be able to tell I was a novice at this, but his construing of my the context of what I was saying, which is what you are entitled to, liberal construction uh, of your pleadings, you still have to follow the law when you're a pro se, but having him in the beginning really allowed me to develop and, and, develop and grow into what uh, has made me relatively successful as, as a self-represented litigant. So I definitely have to say, and I guess you can tell with his demeanor, that he's not as awful as uh, some judges I'm sure many people have seen, and definitely not as bad as some of the other judges, uh, other judges that I saw in the 13th Judicial Circuit. I'm aware of everybody who studied constitutional law, the state is a piece of paper for Charlie So the state's not bringing this argument. I want to know who is stating that I have done something to them that would rock, that would give rise to the cause of action. Okay. So you again, to the extent that there is some written document or written statement alleging the basis for the charge, that's what you're requesting, correct? I'm demanding that. Yes. Demanding. Okay. And as well as everything else, the record reflect this is not a motion. This is a demand based upon right because I know motions can be summarily dismissed. Well, demand for dismissal. Oh, there we go. Okay. So. Now in that demand, you can demand something and he can disregard as well, which then would cause you, require you to either object to it, which, and, and or, well, you definitely have to object for the, in your appellate court to even, even take it up and preserve your objection and then have a transcript of some sort, because appellate courts, at least in the state of Florida, will only use uh, written transcripts whenever you appeal something, so keep that in mind. Now we have... signed or verified affidavits uh, uh, regarding this case. And then number paragraph five, you want any 
any police or investigative reports that might have been generated in response to the case. That's, and I'm glad that you're reading that, but there's another issue. Let's go back to four. And probably actually the beginning. I want to know, is it the state's attorney, if you're actually a representative or a designated representative of the state attorney, to actually put Mark Olber's oversight in my discovery, the original Now, I want to know, is it your position that you can be the witness, or are you the one that's verifying that what he said was true, or is there an affidavit that said it was true? I don't think he's going to answer your question. Well, I, I, I wanted the record to reflect it more so. The question I'm asking to the court is, who is the accusing party? Because we know it can't be the attorney that's bringing the argument. That's a Transy versus Pagliaro. Well, I'm not going to answer that. Wow. I, Read that Transy versus Pagliaro. I think uh, many people have misinterpreted how that case works. I'm not going to do it here, but I didn't need to make that argument at this time. Then apply. Well, I'm not going to answer that for them, but in terms of the information that you're going to want to be provided, part of that is has to do with a police or investigative report, which you requested. Part of that has to do with the names and addresses of all individuals who may have information relevant to the offense. That should at least answer part of your questions. Uh, also, any statements of any individuals, written statements by that person or verified affidavits regarding the offense. Um, so those all respond to information that you uh, have requested, apparently, or demanded from the state in that regard identity and, and specifics about the alleged offense, okay? Yes, sir. So I understand all that. I don't disagree with you that you're entitled to that information. Um, with regard to that, um, any other information that you have requested or demanded that you've not yet get and that's not set forth in paragraphs three, four, and five? I did a uh, public records request under chapter 119 of the Florida Statute for Sunshine Law to choose with them as well as the Tampa Police Department. Well, that would be that would be no, not for the outside of you, but they got the public records. I guess you would be your custodian records. I, I stamped it and filed it at the state attorney's office. That would potentially be something that would be, although related, would be an independent um, action. In other words, you're filing it under uh, chapter a one. separate chapter uh, that deals with public entities and institutions and their obligation to keep public records and provide those upon proper demand or request. So. Okay. That, that's fine. Like that would also be also a to do that. issue, I believe. If not, uh, they're, they're not going to necessarily comply with a public records request to the city of Camp. Correct? But they're compelled to comply with any public records request in accordance with the Constitution for the city of Florida. Well, that would be something that, again, from the purposes of what I'm going to be dealing with, I'm going to deal with the issues relating to right. this case. And if there's information that, under the rules or applicable legal authority, uh, relating to a criminal charge that you're not getting, I will certainly uh, address that. Okay, let me see this. Uh, a lot of this, the first couple of times that I, I heard it, sounded kind of good, but it's now it doesn't sound as good because I've become a little bit more aware. But let me say this: it's better to get to the point. What's the what's the reason that you're there? Address the reason that you're there and let that be the focus of why you're there. As far as the Chapter 119 request, which is a public records request at the state level in Florida, and you check your own state if you're not in Florida, for the public records request, if the information that the city of Tampa has is not necessarily related to the issue before the court, it's not going to matter in the court. The court's going to continue to move the case forward. So I just wanted to say that and make sure I put that out there clearly, clearly, for, clearly for everybody. Excuse me. And again, we can move forward if anybody wants any, if you want more specifics as to what I mean when I make some of these comments, of course, you can always contact me. But we're going to keep moving along. This is, again, part two. Um, anything else outside of, now you mentioned Chapter 119, that's going to take its own step. That would be outside of, yes, sir. What other things do you have here that you've requested that you haven't gotten? Well, I requested because it's, I'm, I'm unclear as to whether... I know that Mark Holver is, has been elected, so that's in Article uh, 2, Section 5, and Article 2, Section 8 of the Constitution issue, as well as uh, well, not Article 5 of the EU. But I don't know who is the actual person who is bringing the charge. What prosecutor's name on the record? Because I needed their information to know so I can know if I have a redress later that they're bringing an action that is. Um, supported by probable cause. 
That would be uh, an issue of what we call later on, we learn later on and talk about, which is a malicious prosecution, which I did have the ability to bring a malicious prosecution action to this case because it, the outcome did end in my favor. I did not do that. Uh, <clears throat> I have another case, actually uh, three of them, where the malicious prosecution issue is going to be raised, but not this one. I would need this information if I wanted to file a suppression motion. I couldn't have done that because they haven't done the very minimum. Well, that goes to the issue. To the, it, to, to the, the foundation of the issue. Right. In terms of the identity of whoever you believe is or is not, I believe that whatever documents that you receive in the course of the case, to the extent that those documents are legally required to be found, I think that would be the extent of the information that you're legally entitled to. So um, if you should glean from that whenever you can glean from that, if you get the documents and you're not satisfied, at an appropriate time, we can never readdress the issue. Uh, I, but I, I think part of the, the demand for dismissal is that there's information that you've requested, you haven't gotten that, and when that information is provided, it may satisfy all of your inquiries, or there may be some lingering issues that you believe are outstanding, and um, we won't know until you actually get that discovery, which you will get. Okay. So, so I guess that right there, the very least to the fact that we're not going to get this dismissal, but I hope that you see it on the record. We'll walk over. Yeah, we're going to come back to that argument. Okay. All right. And, and, and again, I know the information requests. What are the other? I don't know if we've gone through the one through one. Well, we're, we're, I think we're pretty much through six because the competent okay. witness issue is uh, pertinent and absolute germane. To competent in terms of what? Mental who competency or how? Well, let me, let me, let me articulate my question. Okay. Competency in terms of mental competency or competency in terms of someone who allegedly observe the events about which the person would testify. Well, mental is kind of, I would think, is broad. I don't understand mental would be whether or not they have full, a full assertion of the law versus statute, which we know is super, okay. Okay. substantially okay. different now. But right. competent meaning that they can describe and articulate, which is constitutional, uh, and that would be a Delaware versus Prowl, saying the state versus perfect issue. As a prelude for you all to get ready, if there is a suppression issue, they have to have an articulable defense to you. Uh, um, Articulated in offense prior to even bothering me. Because now my rights are going to be the only right. My rights are going to now have an issue. Have I been violated? Which, in fact, I have been. And I've subsequently been well, violated. I, I think the well. answer, the initial answer to that, will be based on whatever the state does provide. And if there's deficiencies in that, from your perspective, uh, we can address that at, at another court date. So, I'm, I'm, again, I think part of the, uh, uh, the request. Before I, I go with this right here, um, one thing that I definitely noticed and it's been brought to my attention by uh, someone who observed, observed me, uh, who actually is an, uh, a lawyer, said, you know, I probably could help myself if I, not, nothing wrong with arguing, because that's what you're there to do is to argue in case you said, don't interrupt. So I'll tell anybody out there before you get out there. And you'll probably hear me and a couple of other judges get close to the interrupting part. And that's something I need to definitely work on uh, moving forward. Uh, it's probably pausing 1.2 or 3 seconds before uh, speaking after the judge is finished. Now, the man, now this is chapter 876 of the Florida Statute. We're not in that. We, well, that's where we are. Seven. My, my seven is I demanded on the record for the record. This is within my demand for dismissal, which is scheduled for today, which is the reason for my notice of hearing. It is on the record and for the record, the following pursuant to 876 of the Florida statutes, an official copy of the public employment oath of all prosecutors, public officials, I have yours, and Mark Overs, and policy enforcers, and police officers. And, and to date, none of these requests have been satisfied by an opposing party. Now, I know. Any of us who have taken an oath at one point or the other, someone can take more than one, know that it's our obligation to satisfy that requirement. And where some of us are actually bonded. And that your suggestion is you're entitled to the oath, you're entitled to a copy of the employment oath? I'm entitled, I, I have your, I'm entitled to the oath of employment. That's 8764 statute, subsection 5. And there are some serious ramifications if we don't do these things that are requested. In subsection six, and then there's ten as well, and it does cover everybody. Subsection nine. 
these things being probably unrelated to these things are definitely unrelated to the issues of the stock. Yes, sir. Okay. And again, I didn't know this. I didn't know all this at the time that this case was taking place. E-filing is the greatest thing in the world, people. Trust me. If your state has it, use it because it's easy to serve people. Everything is easy to track, and they can't run around and clean what they don't have. So keep that in mind. But as far as a lot of this other stuff, it may matter. I, like I said before, if I actually win the case, which in this case, of course, I did. And the other ones I have as well. If you want to bring an issue of malicious prosecution in. Uh, I'll say this also. In the state of Florida, and I don't know what... Wherever your state is, you want to look for this. People in Florida can go to uh, 768.28 section 9A, and you'll find something pretty interesting there. That's what in Florida could allow you to pierce the veil of qualified immunity as it relates to public officials' uh, performance of their duties, uh, and it has to do with malice. Y'all might want to uh, check that out, and if you're in another state, Check out and see if your state has a similar statutory uh, uh, way of, of going around that qualified immunity. Because don't forget, the federal court level, you're not going to be able to deal with the issue of qualified immunity necessarily. But if you can have them supplementally from a series from the same event, use that state statute up, up at the federal court level. You might be able to get something to, to move in your way. And I can better articulate that at another time as far as uh, supplemental uh, jurisdiction uh, for the federal courts if you ever file an action uh, in the federal court. The case is a public all the time. No, 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 you have a copy of this? Yes, I do have a copy of the motion. Of this, it's a demand for dismissal, but incorporated within the demand for dismissal are also other demands that are not dismissal related. There are just other demands for information and other things like that. So, <coughs> we'll go back to the issue of the One more. For clarity purposes, those issues do become relative if the person who is actually operating within the function doesn't have the authority to operate within that function, then they're operating outside of the law, so that it is relative and pertinent. Well, I'm not going to, at this point, rule on the issue of relevancy or not. I'm just going to make sure that for purposes of um, what's been demanded on the record, that you're aware of that Based on that, um, the state can make whatever appropriate the reply they want to those items, and we'll see where that goes, okay? Now, here's something that was interesting, and I know that the Florida jurisprudence is not necessarily a uh, Gibraltar-style rock for legal presidents, even though it kind of covers certain things. It states quite clearly, if you want to copy the this one, that as far as general rights or the Declaration of Rights in Go to paragraph one actually. Is about the what are you referencing? I'm sorry. The Florida jurisprudence. I'm going to read it since 
record. You see, these are important rights of the accused and cannot be legally invaded by the too strict application of judicial uh, or statutory rules of evidence or procedure. Now, I'm sorry, because I don't know what, you don't have to give it to me, but you can read it, but oh. your reference is what? The, What's as far as certain rights, and the, the, the thing is, I don't believe in coincidence, my honor. Do me a favor, though. You're making a context. The heading of the article you're reading. Oh, it's the General Declaration of Rights. It's generally, and it's called the Declaration of Rights under Criminal Law. And this is from the Florida Jurisprudence. There's uh, something that we call taking mandatory judicial notice. It, take a personal note of that, and if we ever have another discussion, uh, either on blog talk or somewhere else, we can talk about those kind of things. Some of that I don't think really matters, but I want to make sure he gets to a couple of other points. And again, Judge Conrad is doing a, a pretty good job. Uh, he's doing actually a great job. Uh, I'm doing uh, a job, I guess, moving up, moving the case along to get to what I need in the end. But again, this is, took a lot longer than it really needed to, and that's my fault. Okay. Okay. It's it's not specific to any one issue. It's just a, whatever your rights are. Well, they cite O'Berry versus State, and this is 1904, and we know that unless it's been otherwise overturned, which I don't have any proof that you can provide that, I would appreciate that because I'm making that orally on the record. That once these things have become an issue in the courts of rule, they're substantial law. But what issues are you talking about? That you can't create a rule and then operate outside the rules. I'm not sure which one, but I don't know the Well, they had the 15 days. She's already acknowledged on the record that she got right. But, I, but again, you're, if you're Here's the thing that's going to be challenging for you and probably challenging for me as well, because I may not agree with you on things that you're suggesting. I, I'm, I'm going to follow um, the rules of uh, criminal procedure as have been interpreted by the Florida courts in application, okay? I'm not aware of a per se rule of dismissal that occurs when someone doesn't timely uh, file or respond to a, a discovery request, okay? If you have authority, you want to come back to me and say, uh, well, I, I will do that. Yeah. I'd like to speak for almost 40 minutes now. If we wind up coming back and you say, Judge, under State versus Smith, hypothetically, they did not respond to me in writing within 15 days after receiving my demand, then I'm entitled to an automatic dismissal under this case. If that's what it says, I will follow that law, obviously. And um, if the request or the uh, what you're asking for is legally supported, uh, I'll grant the request. I'm just telling you I've done this, obviously, for some period of time. I'm not aware of any legal authority in the state of Florida that would suggest that a failure to timely file a response to a request for discovery uh, requires an automatic dismissal. And actually, it would probably be overturned if I impose the sanction of dismissal without giving the, uh, the state a reasonable opportunity to comply uh, with the request. So. Um, as to that, I'm, I'm going to note your objection uh, on the record. Or, uh, I would have um, the objection on the record today. For your, your, your demand for dismissal um, based on the failure to timely comply with discovery. I'm not going to grant the dismissal at this point. What I am going to do, though, is I am going to, based on the grid of discovery that he provided, okay, what he's requested, uh, I'm going to um, order the state to provide that information to you within 10 days from today. It'll be today anyway, but um, I, I believe it'll be 10 days from today, and today is June the 10th, so they are to provide that information to you no later than Friday, June the 20th by 5 p.m., and in the event that uh, you don't get that information uh, provided by them, uh, I will entertain sanctions at that point in time, okay? The sanctions to include and up to dismissal of actions? It could, okay. it could, yeah. All right, I just wanted the record to reflect. Now, do they have... Now, before I let him finish, and we only have a few more minutes, so once it gets about the 30 minute mark, it's pretty much filler. Uh, I'll come back and at, later on that day, but Judge Conrad is absolutely correct. And I wanted to touch on a couple of things. My frustration, even in this, uh, hearing you hear it in my voice at the time, and probably you hear it now because I'm thinking, wow, I was really a jackass in some instances, but um, I made it through there. Is a lot of my frustration then was based upon my ignorance and just wanting a dismissal of the action, which is, I'm sure everybody can understand. Uh, e like I said, the e-filing thing came out a little bit later, but um, he is liberally construing my uh, motion for dismissal, whatever it is that he's, he's looking at. 
I know it's emotions hearing, but in other words, what he's doing is he's taking what is probably not what they would consider legally sufficient or legally sufficient writing, looking at it and allowing me to explain what it is that I what I want, and he is interpreting that. Now I want to make sure I make I, I, this is clear, people. Even if you are a pro se, you get these. You have, you're entitled to liberal construction. Look up that for yourself. But we have to stay within the cons, uh, the confines of the law. You know, we still have to operate within law. So it's and that's just what I've learned through my experiences. My experiences have taught me that. So there may be some other people with other experiences, but I'm just showing you and giving you a narrative of what was going on in my mind at that time versus where I am today. So that as you put all these other videos that come later on down the line for other cases, you'll see the evolution in the information uh, I had as a pro se. And by the way, per se means as it is, or it's, you know, it speaks for itself, so that's what per se means. So in other words, show me where, because they did this, that in and of itself constitutes this response from the, the court.
Uh, that's going to be something that I'm going to deny uh, a motion to dismiss, although that's not a motion. You know, it kind of is, but it's a demand and a motion or a request for dismissal. I'm going to deny that at this point without prejudice to you to refile in the event that the information that you requested is not uh, otherwise provided to you, okay? Yes, the only other issues would be under paragraph one. I'm going to reserve ruling on that. I'll take a look at Article 3 as well as 28 U.S.C. Uh, subsection 3002, and then I'll make a decision whether it's applicable or not applicable, and then I'll make a ruling on the record uh, with that. How quickly do you want to come back? Do you want to set the case well, for trial? I guess I could do a memorandum of law in support of the reason for dismissal prior to giving the, prior to their 10 days running out. Okay, let me ask you a question. This said is we, we should be able to do it except for July the 1st, right? Yes, okay, so we're still on track. Um, if you need to get something addressed before then outside of potentially if I don't dismiss it or impose sanctions, if you need to get it addressed at some point before that, um, you're going to have to call my assistant and get a date. So if is you mail it out today, you should get it by Wednesday, I'm hoping, or no, Thursday. And if there's any issues, call my office and uh, if you need to set up additional hearing time before July the 1st, we'll do that. Okay. Bring it to court at 1.30. And I guess we can, if, we're, if we're going to reapproach it, that's the case that he may. I'm not. You're the one. You're the one. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not reapproaching anything <laughs> at this point. Well, well I guess there's always the question of what's the offer, and the question is also, uh, I guess within that offer, they can offer to just not prosecute the action. I, I don't think they're inclined to want to do that, but that I'll let them answer that. That's what I would say on the record. I appreciate that. Okay, so let's do this. We're going to see you back here. Uh, uh, July the 1st at 9 o'clock is still the trial day that we're going to have. However, if you get any information, and I want to make sure you have to know how to do this, uh, you, you, you have a, a, a seemingly a good understanding of what your arguments are, you make sure whatever you want me to consider, you file with the clerk, because if they're not filed with the clerk, they're not a matter of record, and then your whatever arguments you're going to make are not going to be able to be heard because they're not filed in the official court file. I was kind of concerned because... Well, she's saying she didn't have whatever, so. That's the so, of court. So, what's that? Something to do about the court. Yeah, show them that. What is that? I have everything I, which I did. Is that received in court or not? No. What is that? I'm not sure. It's, it's a stamp that says it was received in our Is that your stamp or you don't know? It's probably from front camera. There's two, there should be one for the state attorney. We need to have court. that, we need to, we need to know where these documents are then, okay? Because it looks like a original pleading filed, I know that was on June, well, when was this? This was June. They were probably for the notice of hearing, but. The, well, this was the demand for dismissal was June 3rd, so that should be in there. You can get that back to As well as the one for the notice of hearing, but I'll, I'll make sure. But again, you make sure if you want another hearing date before your July the 1st, call, you did it before, just call my assistant. Tell her why you're calling, and that the judge said to get you scheduled. She'll coordinate with me, and we'll bring out any other matters before except for trial and trial. All right, I appreciate sir. it. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, anything else on the record? All right, courts adjourned. Us. Mr. Alconti. Mr. Dawson is present in the courtroom. Yes, I'm All right, you want to hand that to him? Uh, actually, no. <laughs> I don't want you to acknowledge anything. Okay. I just want okay. to make it easier for you to get it. And again, if there's anything you need to follow up, Mr. Doss, get my assistant, then we'll give you more time if you need that. Okay? I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Say versus. Uh, okay, so that right there would get rid of that little piece that we had to take care of. So now we move this to the side. I guess it matters. Um, so. Here's where we are at this point in this proceeding. We've gotten through. He's we got we've gotten through my initial uh, motions hearing, where judge the judge compelled the state to give me the information that I asked for. I don't even remember what it is. I'm going to go look for it. Uh, I can almost guarantee you that it's a, a bunch of 
things that may not necessarily have had any, have gotten me to remedy as quick. It may have been a lot of uh, what I'll call internet filler that um, over time I kind of learned how to get rid of. The issue, the, the basics of anything is going to boil down to issue, rule, analysis, conclusion. They have CRAC, they have a bunch of other things that teach them law, but always know IRAC, the issue, the rules, uh, legal analysis and conclusion. Also, focus on getting to your point, which is what I definitely wasn't doing a good job at. In here, I'll say that as a, a critique myself. When it comes to crime or criminal law, probable cause, reasonable suspicion, uh, making sure that you focus on what that is so that you can hopefully move towward a suppression. If you suppress, what, like in this case, a traffic stop, and there's some other issue after the stop. In my case, they were claiming the issue after the stop was I had no license. There was no other issue other than they stopped the vehicle and there's a license issue. Uh, but there was only one citation, so there's no accompanying reason to articulate the stop. And then we may have a violation of uh, the Fourth Amendment with that right there. <clears throat> I guess I must have finally read, I'm looking at these some notes that I was listening to this myself. Improper, just, uh, I should have just labeled it as a motion. Uh, even a demand is fine, but in, in this case and in this court, a writ wouldn't be necessary. But one thing that is definitely, hopefully coming out to those who may not know is know the process, know procedure, and things would tend to work well. Uh, Judge Conrad did a good job of helping us all out. So that being said, hopefully we all got a little something out of it. You can see my information here on the screen. If you'd like to support the channel, you see the Cash App, Brazil, uh, the PayPal. And if you just need to, to ask a question or two, you can go to gregdoss.com and put your information in there. I'll get your email and we can go with it from there. So I will get started or be looking probably within a, the next couple of days from the release of this one uh, for the part three to the case of 14 CT 66525 involving me in the state of Florida, but which will ultimately end with me winning the case. Y'all take care.